Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the afternoon of Monday, April the 3rd. All of our council is present. Item one on our agenda for this meeting is uh, to review tonight's council agenda. So, council, I know we just went over this a uh, few days ago, but uh, any questions regarding anything on the agenda for tonight's meeting? Mr. Summers. I had one. Oh, yeah, Mike. Um, Mr. Brady, on item 4G, um, I don't have an issue with it specifically, but it, it's why are we suddenly responsible for spraying the weeds along the State Route 24 and what looks like an increasing number of uh, access points and egress points from the US 60? Is this getting shifted to us? Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, I think there, there, there. The answer is yes. Uh, as we enter into new intergovernmental agreements with ADOT for different projects, they are seeking to have us take on some basic maintenance. So yeah. they're just they're shifting what they used to do to us. There are there are areas of the city. Say the 60s is a good example where we don't we don't maintain that ADOT right of way. We're working in discussions on a draft intergovernmental intergovernmental agreement that will call cover all of the existing interchanges. But for new interchanges and for the freeway extension in particular on the 24, we did take on some additional responsibilities. Right. Would we anticipate that more of these interchanges are gonna be shifted to us or are these just new interchanges? I'm not sure yet. Yeah. That, okay. That's a continue, that's a conversation that's continuing. Discussions yeah. Yeah, but anything new, we're new. going to take yeah, on new. responsibilities that new we don't sure. have on the existing system. So new for sure and existing possibly. It's, it's a work in progress right now. Um, ADOT as part of the re diamond grinding of the US 60 is also going to be doing some work on the interchanges themselves. So we think we've come to a place where we might have an agreement. Actually, obviously we'd have to come back to, to this council uh, to approve uh, the intergovernmental agreement, but anything new we are taking on some things we haven't done before. All right. I, I just noticed it because it's, it's shifting responsibility and there's a fiscal impact to us right. now that we're going to have to maintain something new. What I would add, Council Member, is that if we had accepted ADAT's original proposal, we would have taken on a lot more and we pushed back pretty hard on that. So, uh, playing defense. So. Thank, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Good <laughs> luck in the future. Yeah. Thanks, RJ. I have to say I do uh, occasionally sit at uh, interchanges coming on, coming off of the freeway, coming onto City of Mesa streets, and notice uh, a lot of weeds. I mean, it, it, it's there's whoever's responsible, whether it's us or ADOT, is not doing a wonderful job at certain spots. Mayor, yes, there are certainly. If if you were to drive our streets, you can tell when you leave ADOT right away and enter City right away generally just by looking around. Yeah. So at least there'll be a benefit, which should be cleaner. Yeah, the, and again, that's something that's a work in progress. One of the things we started doing a while ago, I'm gonna to get too far off on a tangent with the agenda, item, but we started sweeping the ADOT um, overpasses and underpasses because they weren't doing it. And literally our contractor was picking up the brooms and driving through the ADOT right away and then putting the brooms back down. You know, so that didn't make sense. Um, but they really wanted us to go much further than we were comfortable mm -hmm. doing. So there's still discussions to be had. Okay. Thank, thank you. Other. Council, other uh, questions regarding tonight's agenda? I just had a quick question on 5A, the real reimagine. Is yes. that um, coming? Is that on pause and it's coming back? Or I, I sort of got the idea. It's just idea. been on a very long journey. Okay. And so I think, uh, the, but it's moving in a good direction okay. where we're now we're trying to staff it up and get some more meat on the bones as far as moving forward with some specific plans. It's been moving uh, through the region. At one point, um, it was known as Vos Chalet, and the city of Mesa was working with our um, Corps of Engineers and others now with ASU has taken on a role and then I think eventually it's going to go to the Maricopa Association of Governments but this funding allows us to participate with other communities that, are, that benefit from the development of, the, of this path or this of the Rio Salado area so I think it's a good place for us to be we need to be involved in that discussion we're excited about the potential development and opportunities that um, would follow from there so so I guess it's, 
don't know if it starts and stops. It kind of, um, somebody's always working on it, I think, and discussing it, but there's just so many different um, groups involved that so I think it's just kind of pulling everybody together. And is this the first time they've done an intergovernmental agreement where they've had a, a representative? I think so. Or that sounds right now. Is that on, correct? Is that, that what you understand? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. This is the first time, based on the statement of intent that was appro basically approved back in 2018, the goal was for the communities to work together to find or identify ways of moving forward in a collaborative effort. So this is the first IGA that is specifically for hiring the personnel that is going to coordinate all those activities. And what is that? I'm sorry, the term was like four or five years or something like it's, that. It's four years. Um, so it's right now, the duration is four years. That's what they're anticipating. Okay. And after four years, they will evaluate to see the status of basically the project, the coordination, and see what will be the need to carry on or moving forward. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, any other questions regarding tonight's agenda? Okay. Ask. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just curious, like, what is, wh how come this falls under you? Oh, oh. that's a really, no, that's a, <laughs> you can't ask that question. <laughs> question. So, it, well, I didn't want to answer it either. This is, this is actually long range planning. So long range planning, basically where they coordinate with various planning of the waterways. Um, so this is really falls under city planning. So, but in addition to that, we coordinate with transportation, parks and recreation and all that. So there's various coordination, but it's a citywide effort, so. But I, th this is a point, good point. Right now it's in the planning stage. Okay. So I think that's where it falls here. And, well, and also his, his uh, predecessor. predecessor volunteered to take this on. Oh, so, so then it to... fell to you. Well, because I would, you know, I'm always trying to make sure I know which departments do what, and I couldn't make the connection on uh, this one, so yeah, I was trying to figure not out. Was okay. Easy, but yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Council, any other questions regarding tonight's agenda? All right, thank you. Hearing none, um, Item 2A on our agenda for this meeting is a presentation and to provide direction on the Transportation Department budget. So, RJ, welcome back. <laughs> okay. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. Nice to see you again. Uh, again, RJ Zeter with the Transportation Department. To my left is Eric Guderian, Deputy Transportation Director for Traffic Engineering. And to his left is Orlando Otero, who is our Deputy Director for Field Operations. Uh, we are pleased to discuss uh, uh, the proposed uh, budget for fiscal year 23-24. As always, if you have questions, please jump in uh, and ask as we move along. I won't read the whole mission statement, but uh, in simple terms, we plan, design, and operate uh, and maintain a high-quality multimodal transportation system for the city. Our objectives are relatively straightforward. Uh, first is maintaining what we have, and you'll see that come out in uh, budget adjustments uh, that we are seeking, is maintaining the existing infrastructure is always our highest priority. Monitor and address safety. Uh, and that's something that Eric's team does uh, through the traffic studies group of looking at areas where, you know, maybe we have high accidents, do we get requests from a school or a neighborhood, uh, either we'll work with our engineering department to implement improvements or sometimes we partner with Orlando and his team uh, and have done some projects in-house, whether they be crosswalks uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then keep up with development. Obviously, we have a lot of development still happening in the city. Uh, both new development, primarily in Southeast Mesa, but as well as redevelopment occurring uh, throughout Mesa. And that it includes working with uh, our engineering department on projects that are within our Mesa Moves capital program, but also we have uh, plan reviewers on staff that review new developments or redevelopments for traffic impacts. And we work closely with NANA staff in development services. Some performance measures, uh, 
Pavement Condition Index, or PCI, is measured as zero to 100. 100 is a brand new street. So we've been pretty consistent. There's a blip in the data, which I can't explain going back to 2016, but generally we've been pretty consistent uh, in terms of our overall average PCI score. Um, but part of keeping up with that goes to some other items we'll talk about in the, in the presentation as we move along. Street lights. Uh, this is converting our existing high pressure sodium uh, system to uh, LED. Uh, although it shows red, that's only because this is a quarterly measurement. Uh, overall, we're actually ahead of schedule. We've got about 45,000 streetlights in the city, and we've converted a little over half of them to the new uh, LED technology. Um, the measure will actually slow a little bit, or the, the, the outcome, because once we get onto the arterial streets, the busy streets, uh, for safety reasons, we always have a follow truck. But our staff, in keeping up with our other performance measure, which is repairs, uh, are doing an outstanding job in converting the system to LED. RJ, I'm sorry. Can I yeah. ask you a quick question on yeah. back on the um, all streets pavement condition? Index? Sure. Is that a national standard? Uh, where it is. You, okay. A and the target is. How do we determine our target? I, I could actually sit down and show you. I, I okay. can generally explain that. 100, again, is a new street. Right. And then we can actually show you the life cycle of the street of when we do various treatments. So a new street is 100. A few years into the new street, we'll do what's called a fog seal, which is the lightest application that we do. So the PCI has dipped a little bit. That'll raise it back up. And looking at a 40-year life cycle for, for streets, there's different applications we do at different times. Mm -hmm. At some point, those applications are no longer going to work, and when the PCI drops below 50 is when uh, a street becomes eligible for resurfacing. And that's where we work with Beth Huning and the engineering staff. And identify, we identify the projects, and Beth and her staff uh, implement the, or administer uh, the overlay program. Again, is that a city of Mesa? When yeah, it drops so below 50? RJ, across the entire city, right? Yes, From that's the oldest part of the city to the newest part of the city, on average, we're trying to maintain above 80. Is that correct? correct? Okay. So is that, I think that's what you, is that what Yeah, you I was just curious is well, if so the we, city we, sets the we, 70 yes, target. Okay. We set the 80, so that's, we create an internal yeah. standard. I don't know how that compares nationally. Yeah. I, I, we could do some checking, but I have that's to curious. believe that we compare right. favorably okay. on a national level. We, our target is actually above 70, but we're at 80 mm -hmm. and we want to stay there. You know, so, but as, as Chris points out, you know, this could be the newest street oh, in sorry. East Mark averaged against the oldest street, you know, someplace else uh, in Mesa. But, um, and then between Orlando's maintenance staff and then working with Beth Huning and her staff, it depends on what we're doing as to who's doing the work. Thank you. Uh, street lights we discussed, graffiti. We had a little blip, uh, but our goal, and we're just about there, is within one business day of notice of uh, graffiti. This is a high priority item for our department. If you drive around Mesa, and if you see anything, please let us know. You can use the Mesa Now app, or you can let us know if you see something. But we uh, counsel with the approval of this current year budget, authorize the addition of a second graffiti abatement uh, employee. Still waiting for a vehicle for that person but this is very high priority for us. Actually, um, I've been out with our, our, our employee and the bulk of the graffiti abatement does not actually come from the public. We just have people who know where it is. So I would say about 30% is uh, Collins or Mesa now, um, but we know where the regular hotspots are. But if you see that anywhere, please let us know. Sorry, Ms. Sorry, Ms. Duff, any, any questions? Okay. Yeah, I, said, Mike, I saw the 2020, I, guess, I think that's just a mark of where the year is, assuming that 2022 is to the right. I don't know, is this graph all of 2020? What is this oh. representation of the time period? Yeah. Good question. It's an annual measure, so no, this is, it's I'd have to. Play. This is a monthly measure. It's a monthly measure, sorry. So I'd have to go back. Well, we're, it's, it's just going back in time, so I'd say this is probably taking us back to about 2018. A monthly measure on the left yeah. side. Um, but the other graft on the right side. We had a dip, and that was with some personnel change. So is that an annual? What, what is the time period? Well, it's, it's, it's a monthly measure. So if you're looking across the top, this is how we're doing month to month. <coughs> so we had, we, back in 
2017-ish, when I first started with the city, we actually went from having a contractor do the work to bringing it in-house, which has been very successful, because you can see almost a straight line across and staying within that 24-hour uh, measure. Uh, we had a staff change, and that explains the little dip you'll see on the right edge of the, of the slide. So the right edge is... The most 20, current. 20, most current, so it's 2023. 23? Yes. Okay. And 2020 is just the midpoint I and mean, a measure of time maybe from... 2018 or something. Yes. So, yeah. I'm going to guess. Yes. Okay. We can right. we can we can refine this slide better. No, I just we wanted can. to kind of Yeah, so historically it probably goes back to about 2017. Yeah. Is the first okay. measures and the more recent one is probably going to be was going to be January February on this it should chart. take us for the end of February, February yeah. of this year. That's the last dot would be February of 23. We were going back and forth at the beginning with whether or not we were going to stay in-house or remain contracted. And again, I'm pleased to say that since we brought it in-house, we've been very successful in staying on top of it. The challenge when we had the contractor was they didn't want to come in for single um, issues. They wanted to aggregate them. So that kind of threw off the, the timeline. Expenditure summary. So, you know, working from left to right, you'll see actuals for last fiscal year uh, running up to the proposed uh, budget for fiscal year 23-24. Uh, we'll get into the budget adjustments that we're asking for, which uh, primarily affect uh, field operations, although there's one equipment request within, within Eric's group. I will note that, again, working with Beth Huning and the engineering team, council last year authorized increasing the overlays budget from 10 million to 20 million. So uh, we've, we and, and Beth Steph have done a lot of work ramping up so that we can really attack that this year to hit that 20 million um, overlay uh, forecast that we have. So um, the increase from 67.5 to 73.9 million from 22, 23 to 23, I'm sorry, I got to go back. Uh, the revised budget, um, 72.6 to 73.9 is largely the staff addition that we'll talk about in a few moments. And RJ, you can just speak to, <clears throat> just a reminder to the city council, um, all of this is coming out of the street maintenance fund. So the, the, the 90 some percent of our budget or higher is split between two funding sources, highway user revenue funds, which is a mix of license fees and gas taxes uh, or registration fees. The other part is coming from the three tenths of one cent local street tax that the voters approved some years back, which is dedicated to street maintenance. And we're fortunate that we have that because uh, it allows us to do more, frankly, than a lot of other cities are, are able to fund. We have a tiny amount that we get when we do work in parking lots for other departments, but it's really pretty in insignificant when you look at our total budget. And I bring that up just because what will happen is if we're not able to spend all the money on street overlays in one year, it just rolls over into the next year. It doesn't get swept off anywhere. And so we're really trying to increase our capacity on street maintenance because just like sales tax has been coming in a little, little bit higher than typical, than we've historical, sorry, we're able to, and you'll see some of that in the improvements he's been talking about, but I just want street maintenance, our goal is to continue to increase the number of lane miles that we're able to apply that application to. So, and that'll go back to the PCI eventually too, yeah, well. that as we've doubled the amount, or not doubled, but we've added $10 million more right. into the budget for uh, street maintenance, and that's the result of just improvement in the sales tax allows us to um, adjust to that level. But it is restricted funding, so... Yeah, it's only for street... We're trying to take as much back into the infrastructure as, as we can. But as Chris points out, we doubled the funding, but it doesn't double the lane miles because, frankly, costs have gone up. Um, so now we get into our budget adjustments. Please, again, ask questions if, if you have any. I won't read all the line items, but right now we rely on a single contractor to do all of our concrete repairs. This is not building new roadways or new sidewalks as part of roadways or paths. This is really day-to-day -day maintenance. And the, the challenge that we have right now is with our single contractor and, and the single crew is that if you were to report a, a sidewalk heave on an arterial street, it could take as long as 30 days to get out and repair that and we would like to cut that in half or better uh, if we can. So the thought is, is that we would create an in-house crew 
And this is very similar to the model we use for asphalt repairs and others where we have a core group of in-house staff that hit high priority areas and then we do larger projects with our contractors. So the proposal is to add six full-time employees and equipment and lower those safety uh, related repairs from 30 days to 15 days or less. And again, it goes back to the funding that the funding is there that it can support this between HERF and the local street fund. Ms. Billsbury. So this is the first time we've, we're trying an in-house concrete We crew? actually had an in-house concrete crew sometime before I started with the city. A decision was made to go completely contracted. So now we're coming back uh, a little bit. Uh, it's something I've been talking about with Mr. Otero for a couple of years. Again, trying to find that balance, you know, but you know, when, you, it, it, when I drive the streets, probably like you, when I see the barricades and the pink paint, you know, and the bump sign, it's like, ugh, I just wish we could get those done more quickly. And so really what we're gonna do with the equipment, we're gonna, we're gonna be doing small jobs, but the high priority jobs and leave the bigger jobs to our contractor. So we'll still be using the contractor, yeah. but this will hopefully get to things faster. And so six full-time employees is what you're yes. looking for then to be able to do this. And I think RJ said it correctly is <clears throat> if we need a large project, a large, we can go through the process and formally procure that. Um, it's these smaller ones. That okay. They're not willing, you know, they're so busy and it's lining up these groups. It's kind of like going back to the street lights. We kind of yes. went through the same thing with replacing out the street lights. We, it was the same thing. It was just easier for us to have our crews do it than to rely upon contractors. That doesn't mean. We certainly employ a lot of contractors for a lot of our big, long capital projects where they're going to logistically put down a lay down and they're going to be there for some period of okay. time, which makes sense for them. We can be nimble and move our folks around in a geographic area and get a lot of little things done quickly. And, and so also to re reiterate then, the money, you're saying we have this money yes, in this the is fund all coming, to use, so this is how you've decided will be a good this way This is to coming out of the that. transportation sales tax. Okay. Mayor, Councilor Spilsbury, we meet with the, the staff from Office of Management and Budget several times a year to go over what they call the forecast. Okay. So we're looking out a number of years to make sure we're not overextending ourselves from a funding standpoint. We're very comfortable we can do this. Within the transportation budget, I'll note real quickly, um, Unlike some departments where the budget is more heavily weighted towards staff, I would say probably 30, to maybe 30% of our department, maybe 40 goes towards staff. The bulk of our budget actually goes to contracted services. So oh. everybody else would probably be flipped. Mm, yeah. Okay. The departments would be flipped the other way. Well, so I mean, it's not, this is a small change. It's yeah. not really changing our model you know, too much. It just, as Mr. Brady said, it allows us to be nimble. Because frankly, the contractor doesn't want to come in to just do one, two, two panel sidewalk repair. They want to come in when they have a bigger or more places to, to do work. If it's making the streets safer and quicker and easier to get around, yeah. I mean, it's obviously worth it. And we chose to use the kind of highlight as a pedestrian safety issue okay. on this one because yeah. it's typically, it's not the street itself, it's typically We're the along ramps the, and sidewalks yeah. and the roots are pushing it up. or. Yeah. Something but then happens. it does, because then if the pedestrians have to go into the street, no. and then, I mean, it's, or to me, it's a safety issue. Or there's a mobility challenge, yeah. right, that are, you know, are in a scooter of some kind or yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very high priority for us. Okay, that's great. How often do these things, I mean, how often does this, how often are you contracting for maintenance of sidewalks and these kinds of issues? Is it? Year round. Yeah, every day. Every day. Uh, that's what I was asking. Yeah, you could keep them busy every day. Yeah. As you recall, it wasn't that long ago we had a claim against the city for a buckled up sidewalk. Yeah. And so this just allows us to, we hope, to address those kinds of issues. And this isn't necessarily cost saving, it's more of a timing issue. It's, it's that's right. We would have spent the money otherwise, okay. but now we can, it's timely. That's it's timely. Yeah. We've referred to it as not saving money, but just being able to provide the service faster. Mm -hmm. okay. is, uh, Is the liability for that on the city, or is it depends on, the on how homeowner? many times we walk by it before we decide to fix it? Yeah, but is is there liability for the homeowner for that property too? Depends on I don't know. That, I'm not yeah. gonna, Jim. Not going to point on that now. <laughs> so the mayor gets in the weeds on this, but so we have had a couple claims on sidewalks. So I'll, I'll say we have to have reasonable notice and then have failed to act within a reasonable period of time, and so we're not paying out on many claims involving sidewalks. But obviously we want to be able to say that we're nimble and we're responding timely because that helps prevent future claims and yeah. assist us in the defense. Isn't there also potential claim against the homeowner's property is 
So it is sidewalk. possible, but we also, within the right of way, we have a non delegable duty to also maintain right of way. And so, um, you know, it's possible a plaintiff could bring a, a, a lawsuit against um, the adjoining property owner under another theory, but they rarely do because we have a non delegable duty no. and they know we have to. It doesn't happen much. It's possible. So this addresses that issue too. We yeah. get it fa done faster. Yeah, we had actually worked with our contractor hoping they could stand up a second crew, but that didn't seem to work out. So this is our approach to that. Uh, paving equipment. Um, this is a request, a one-time request to buy some larger equipment that our in-house staff will use uh, on, on, on asphalt work. We found out recently uh, when we were doing some paving work up in the Lehigh neighborhood that we were kind of stretching the limits of our the equipment we had. So we're not asking for staff. This is just allowing the staff that we have um, to do some larger jobs. But it, it goes along with what we were talking about with concrete, that we, we have in-house work. We also have contracted work. But this will allow uh, better use uh, or larger projects for our in-house staff to perform. RJ, I'll just weigh in. Yeah. You know, watching, you did several miles of paving in the District 1 area. I appreciate that. I know that really the equipment was undersized for what you were doing. And so it took a lot of time and effort by crews to be in there and do the paving work. So, yeah, a lot of those streets hadn't been touched in probably 40 years and the way they were treated. But anyway, yeah, having, having the, uh, are you talking more of the asphalt pavers? It's wider, mm -hmm. a wider machine to handle the width. Bigger compact, you know, a roller, larger paver, you know, just the ability to handle wider jobs, right? Is that the way to say it, Orlando? Yes, it, uh, it gives us more flexibility, you know, so we can do larger passes instead of having to do three passes. We can do two passes. It would be more efficient with the, uh, this piece of equipment. And then the pitch of the road, you know, from, yeah. um, gives us flexibility there. I think you were doing like four passes on some of the streets there. It was um, going back. We learned a lot, you know, and it was the biggest in-house job we had done. And so this is sure. kind of the follow-on to the lessons we've learned from from that. Yeah, work. you trained up those crews to yeah. uh, put asphalt down. I'm going back to concrete. I, I poured thousands of yards of concrete. So you're going to have a ready mix truck. We are. Um, for it, yourself, are you going to mix with a large mixer in the truck, or you're going to? It'll, go it's a ready mix truck, but a smaller one. I smaller, call it a baby mixer, a mini, for a lack mix. of a better term. Go ahead, Orlando. Yeah, uh, Mary Council Member. A mini Freeman. mix, we call them. That was our challenge when we had the crew in the past. Was the short loads is getting the short loads. So yeah. we're thinking having a smaller ready mix truck that we'll be able to take to the batch plant and get the load and bring it to uh, these locations. I think it's, it's going to help us be a little bit more efficient. So um, there was instances in the past where we were waiting for the load and we didn't get it because it's just four yards of concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to bring us 11 yards of concrete. Yeah. So you're going to have a contract with the concrete contractor suppliers <coughs> to yes. put in the... That's part, part of the of, materials the under commodities on this line okay. is that we're estimating about $110,000 a year in materials. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, signals equipment. This is to purchase an additional aerial bucket truck. We work very close with, with Mike and the fleet team, um, but with supply chain issues and that, it, it's a challenge not only to get new equipment in place, but to get parts for existing equipment. So by adding this additional bucket truck, it'll allow us to make sure we can get out and do our uh, signal repairs, which are directly safety related. So this is simply adding a bucket truck to our fleet. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to ask Jay O'Donnell to come up. Orlando, do you want to? Yeah. Oh, you're good. Thank you. Talk about Asian District Monument signage. Jay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Nice to be with you. I'm Jay O'Donnell. I'm the Assistant Economic Development Director. Why am I here as part of transportation? <laughs> it's a cameo um, appearance <laughs> by Jay O'Donnell. Yeah, so. This is the fun part. Um, be, before I get into the presentation about the, the Asian dis District Monument signs, I just wanted to share a little bit of background, specifically with those members of council who may not have been here during the initial branding process of the Asian District and the launch of the Asian District brand. Um, so as part of the expansion of Mesa's redevelopment area, the, the recommendations that came out of that effort was to promote the Asian District as a really unique place and point of pride. And in the findings, it said that marketing that district was really an opportunity to elevate 
this district as a differential point for the entire region and also to revitalize West Mesa. So during 2019, there was a, a steering committee of stakeholders that was formed and that steering committee worked with the Office of Economic Development and two marketing and branding agencies to create a new brand. The Office of Economic Development led that branding effort and we're, we've also led other branding efforts including the Falcon District and we're currently working on the Broadway Corridor. Next slide, please. So the, the new brand was unveiled in January 2020 which was really ill timing um, because it was right before the pandemic, no pun intended. We still promoted the Asian district during the pandemic, but it was a pretty low level. So in 2022, we came back and really relaunched the brand. So we changed out arterial street signs, added banners to street poles. We added traffic signal box wraps, part participated in special events and really just promoted the Asian district um, to new visitors and customers, and it was a very successful program. So in 2022, we added murals to the district for environmental signage, and we now have four beautiful large-scale murals in four different locations in the district. This was a private, public-private partnership with property owners in, in the district. And finally, the big splash that the steering committee worked to develop was these monument signs. And it was really um, conceived as, as finding strategic locations in the district that would immediately announce that you've arrived, so a gateway sign, if you will. And if you notice the Asian district logo there on the screen is a tangram. It's a seven piece, 2000 year old Chinese geometric puzzle, which is, uh, is symbolizing the different Asian cultures in the district coming together while still maintaining the individuality of each culture. Next slide. So the monument signs were designed by the graphic design team who created the logo and now we have a sign company who has recreated the monument signs and provided pricing for what it would cost to build and install two of them on Dobson Road. The monument signs were proposing that the city fund would be located on the east side of Dobson Road and the west. So you can see with the little um, call out map there that um, this is the sign looking north on Dobson Road, just south of the First Avenue corner. And the engineering has been completed so we know where they can fit without disturbing any of the existing infrastructure. You. And this is the proposed sign that would be the first thing motorists see on the right side of the road as they head south on Dobson, just south of Main Street. Both of the signs are large, iconic, they would be well lit at night, and we think they're bold and dynamic. So additionally, we're looking for the private sector to contribute to additional signage down the road. Um, we have a couple of other designs that have been uh, presented. One is a, a butterfly, another one is um, a dancer or a running man, but they're really, really cool signs. So the, the two signs that the city's proposing um, or that we're propo proposing that the city cover would be a one-time cost of $180,000. And, and it's, go ahead, Chris. I was just gonna say, we've done something not with this design, but around the Falcon District with signage, we did something similar, is that correct? We did, in the Falcon District we had, uh, we changed out the arterial signs, um, we also did banners and traffic signal box uh, wraps, and then we also had three of what, what I will call monument or beacon signs in the Falcon District as well. Questions, comments? Ms. Pillsbury. Um, two things is are they they're turned at a slant then they're not like perpendicular to the road so you only see it going one direction you can see it because it's so big they're the way they're configured they are about ten and a half feet tall and then they're 26 feet wide so it's a very large monument sign I don't think you'll miss it necessarily but it is angled slightly so like if you're coming south down Dobson though and this is facing the other direction like you'd be able to say that or see that it says Mesa you think I think so we can get you a um, 
a view, a perspective of it looking the other way so you can see what it, it looks like. It just seems super <laughs> angled to me. Um, is, I, I haven't been around for like approval of these monument signs and I, you hear like a lot of different opinions on certain monument signs right in the city, but is this, that's just a normal cost? Is that how much these things cost? <laughs> yes, these are I mean, that's, Mayor Councilor Spilsbury, substantial signs have, have, you want something that's substantial enough that it's gonna withstand <laughs> the elements and all that, so this is not out of line. And do the, do the actual letters light up or are, are there lights on the sign? Lights projected on the sign. Okay, so the we actual thing doesn't light up. Internal illumination, but that was extremely cost prohibitive. So I really wanna know how Vice Mayor Heredia feels about these, <laughs> since this is his baby. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I, you know, I think we, we've been working with the steering committee, with the stakeholders there, businesses. I think um, they've been very supportive on us adding these features that kind of announce the Asian district even further in this area. So I think folks already know or are getting, we've gotten good media attention. We got good traction around the, all the eateries and grocery uh, options there but even further enhance kind of your at the Mesa Asian district area, right? Like this, these are, I think they look small here, but these are humongous, I think. <laughs> um, and so these will call out, I think the, the, uh, the attention and, and kind of as we build this area uh, to have more kind of walkability in the future, with uh, I think the potential streetcar or, or more transit options, I think having these these types of signage and added features only add to the effect of of a place making uh, place right in our city. Were, was the Asian district were any of those business owners involved in this? Like, have they seen it? They yeah. like it. They like the style and the colors. And yeah, we have a, a, a steering committee. You know, Maycom Plaza, various different businesses there, mm -hmm. H Mart, uh, along Broadway, uh, closer to Broadway. So various different stakeholders that have businesses there have chimed in into, uh, that's how we developed these tang, the Tangram and those features. And as Jay mentioned, we are asking uh, businesses there for additional signage to come up with mm -hmm. funds to support that and I think we have uh, hopefully uh, a good substantial amount now uh, and we need a little bit more uh, so we're we're making calls and having meetings with with the businesses there to see how we can pull funds to add these feet these other features of signage so the same sign or just ones that go in with it like that tie go in into with it, it that tie into us okay yeah. Jay, you mentioned what the other two were like the running man sign. and the oh butter that's butter what you were saying fly. so ones that just tie, like that would have the same color scheme yep. or <laughs> something like that okay <clears throat> yes you know we have some in the Fiesta District, we did that as well. We have branding there, yep. you know, Falcon Field District, now the Asian District, and so all of our districts need some type of this as well. <laughs> right. All right, and yeah. with that, just is the summary to, to conclude that uh, we are asking for one-time uh, budget adjustment of just under $3 million, and then ongoing of 640000 to support uh, the in-house concrete crew. And with that, if you have any more questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Heredi. Going back onto the paving discussion, have we, I know we've tested paving, um, uh, I, I don't know, the kind of substance that I think looking at the future uh, as costs increase, it, has anything worked as far as any innovation around paving streets? Uh, Mayor Councilman Herdia, you may recall a couple of council meetings ago, the council authorized joining the Southwest uh, Asphalt Consortium that's being headed by Arizona State University. And the goal really is to look at pavement design, you know, from a cost effectiveness standpoint. So more to follow. Uh, we have a very passionate uh, pavement management supervisor that works uh, for Orlando who is always and I mean always looking for new techniques. If you have three or four hours free, he'd be happy to explain how asphalt works. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, uh, we have tried some things, you know, cool pavements one, 
you know, you may have read Phoenix has some challenges with uh, some of the product they used. We tested that same product in one of our parking lots, and I'm glad we tried it in a parking lot sure. and not in a neighborhood because it didn't hold up. Sure. You know, so it's it's a work in progress. So but we are we are always looking at opportunities um, for uh, increased pavement life. One of the things we talked about is that on some of our arterial street projects that we do what's called cold in place recycling or cold in place. Yeah. yeah, recycling, where we literally mill the surface of the street and then put it back down uh, on the street. So there's, there's a sustainability component to that, um, but it's also cost. Uh, and, you know, so these are the types. I, I think Mace is a leader, um, but we're always looking for new opportunities. Okay. And then on the LED, how, how long are we, you said we're halfway for throughout the city on, on uh, it's, changing up the, we uh, have a seven-year conversion program seven years. i think we're in year we'll be coming up on year three, three. with the start of the new fiscal okay. year but i'm very confident we'll actually be ahead of our our the goal we've set for ourselves and that was an example where our staff came back and said we can literally save the city millions as opposed to having a contractor come in sure. they said we think we can and we're doing it with our existing staff okay. so they're, they're they're a great group and what's if somebody complains about an outage uh, and you notice that you need to exchange all the the ones in the neighborhood, you still are doing that or, or are yeah. you just fixing that? that Mayor, one? Councilor, we will typically go into a neighborhood and take a look. So yeah. um, if it's a minor repair, we might repair an existing light, but anything of substance, we'll take down the old light and put up a new LED fixture. We also patrol the neighborhood to look if there's other lights that are sure. out, but we, we try to do our LED conversions in you know, not just one-offs right. because there's really a contrast sure. between the new lights and the old lights, and so oh, well. yeah. But that's within our five-day repair turnaround that we have. That's our goal for that for repairs. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Thank you, Mayor. This just some clarification on terminology. So you're referring to the uh, it's a little over three and a half million dollars on the last page it calls it for a uh, fiscal year 23-24 budget adjustment but when i hear adjustment i'm thinking it's this year not next fiscal year so are you looking to add this to the budget for the next fiscal year well, or are we 23-24 is next year's budget yeah uh, but adjustment is the issue that has me confused so we're yeah we're but just adding this to the fiscal 23-24 budget request well, for approval. it's new, right. and it's new, and it will be in the 23-24 budget. Okay. The reason that was unclear to me is we have a revised budget for 22-23 of 72.6 million. Your year-end estimate is actually about 5 million below that. So when I see estimate or adjustment, I thought perhaps we would pay for it out of the no, it's this year, but if you look at that last column where it says 2324, it's revised. concluded in that one. No, okay. and proposed. In the so proposed this will be budget. for the next, starting in July 1 July. for next Correct. fiscal year. Okay. Just need to have that clarified <coughs> in my head. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes. Backing up a little bit, but on the sidewalk repairs, I know you do quite a few in the older part of Mesa, and thank you for all your work on that. Um, in the historic areas, there's been in the past concerns about when it was torn out and had the old WPA and markings on the historic markings and stuff like that. Are we doing anything to retain those? At that time, the contractor was, it, it wasn't, he wasn't, not he, but the, the company was not retaining them. Um, Sorry. Are we able to do anything on that? Mayor, uh, Councilmember Duff, Orlando, do you want to handle that one? I think we are. So, Mayor, Councilmember Duff, we do. We try to preserve those in place. If not, if we remove them, we, we try to... We're keeping them. We keep them. Yeah, we're keeping them. We actually cut out the, the seal back from the Works Project Administration or, okay. you know, back in the New Deal, you know, when a lot... How, that was how a lot of the sidewalks in the downtown were funded. Uh, we are actually... I'd, I'd have to check, but I think we actually have a stockpile of them. Yeah. There's ever a desire yeah, to use those somewhere. 
Yeah. But we're also trying to make the sidewalks. I know you were the example you brought up because the standard we use today is different, obviously, than the standard we use that, you know, 70, 80 years ago, you know, that we're trying to mimic the look as best we can. Yeah. I mean, you can't change the color, right? You know, because right. the new sidewalk is going to stand out. But we are trying to maintain the historic character Good. when we do sidewalk repairs. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Freeman? I was just listening to the conversation here. Uh, cut it, saw cutting out the WPA and then putting it back in the concrete. Is that what you're doing? Or just, I'm, I was just thinking, just make a template of it and then you could stamp it in your concrete just like the WPA <laughs> of old and call it good. But, uh, Councilman, I'm guessing and I don't want to guess, so let us follow up on that. Okay. I can say I have a historic building in downtown Mesa and there's a new sidewalk leading right up to the square that has, I think it's like a 1920s, you know, yeah. stamp in it. And I'm, it's very cool that we, we kept that and it kind of helps tell the story of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a worthy, uh, a worthy effort. Council, any other questions for these gentlemen? All right, Mr. Brady, I saw you making a, an Mr. Smith here. is off. Yeah, we're, Mr. Smith has offered up 10 minutes, 15 minutes for Jody to start. Really? Okay. And then we'll go to the executive session. Is that okay? All right. Uh, that's right. Thank you. You bet. If, uh, if that's our right Jody. So this is the uh, this is the the first part of our transit uh, presentation. We'll just probably make it through the budget, okay. and we'll bring come, we'll back, come back on back the, for the master plan master later. Plan. All right. Okay. So let me I, let me announce you, Jody. Item two B is a presentation <laughs> and to provide direct, direction on the transit services department budget, including an update of the transit master plan. Welcome to have uh, pleased to have Jody Sorrell. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'm Jody Sorrell. I'm the transit services director, and I'm just going to go through our. 2324 fiscal year budget pr proposal for this year. Um, when it comes to public purpose, uh, like RJ said, these are a lot of words, um, but really our purpose is to provide transit options to the residents of Mesa, whether that, and that comes in many different forms. Um, our priorities this next year is going to be the transit master plan. Um, we received some. Um, Specific eight, we received a specifically $800,000 from the federal government for bus shelters. So we'll be matching that with the 400,000 in this year's budget to put up um, about 30 to 40, hopefully 30 to 40 new uh, micro shelters, which I'll talk about later. Um, the Rio East Dobson streetcar study and the Mesa connected TOD study. Um, so just, and, and we just wanted to take a minute and clarify because it gets very confusing when you're talking about the streetcar study and the TOD study. So I wanted to specifically kind of call this out in a, in a map. So the, the solid black line is the streetcar study. That's the first phase. It's called the Rio East Dobson streetcar. And that's one that we'll be initiating with Tempe and Valley Metro probably sometime May or June. Um, the dotted line is the second phase, which is in the regional transportation plan, um, working its way through. So that would be, that's part of that plan. And then the hash line is a potential future alignment. What you see is the, the dashed kind of outline around that, that is the TOD study area. So they're, they're two different studies, but they very much overlap each other. Um, then we want to talk about opportunities that we're working on. We're at looking at increasing trees around our transit stops. We have a lot of places where it makes more sense to put in a tree, like next adjacent to parks, um, city-owned landscape. It might make more sense to put in a tree rather than a full-size shelter. Um, we're going to install the micro shelters that um, were budgeted this year and use the outcome from the transit master plan to drive transit increases. And our challenges are really um, the lack of regional funding past December 2025. And as we grow the shelters and our facilities, our staffing is going to become an issue. Um, in transit, a lot of our, most of our performance metrics are all ridership driven. So um, these are our light rail ridership, our fixed route bus ridership. They're starting to pick up what we'll call post COVID. I'm not sure if we'll ever if we are post-COVID or if COVID is just around in perpetuity. But you can see they're starting to increase and we're, we're seeing an increase. The interesting thing is um, our park and ride usage has not bounced back and that's indicative of our express ridership. 
So your express ridership is still at about 40% of what it was um, before March 2020. So that's more um, employees working from home, maybe not going in every day. There's also been a lot of change in downtown Phoenix. Um, during COVID, the state gave up 500,000 square feet of office space in downtown. So those employees aren't going back to work down at a, at a location. There's been also just changes in more housing coming in as opposed to businesses being located. And then um, our paratransit and ride choice trips, we like this one. Seeing paratransit in yellow is not a bad thing. Our goal is to get more ride choice trips than paratransit trips because ride choice is a, um, it's a more flexible service for our residents and it's a cheaper cost per trip for the city. This is our um, budget summary and we wanted to kind of call out some specific things in here because during COVID transit specifically got in every um, stimulus package, we got funding for transit. Um, overall between fiscal year um, 2021, 22, 23, we got about $47 million worth of, trans worth of federal funding to offset transit. $30 million of that went specifically to services that would have been funded by the general fund. So when you look at the 23-24 budget, it's more in line when you factor in. It's not such a shock if you don't have those COVID numbers to look at. Um, and so after, after this fiscal year, the COVID money will be, um, will be gone. We won't have any more. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. So on the 21-22 actuals, there's COVID dollars that we received on for accessible transit yes. as a one-time expenditure. What was that in? So that was um, so that's money that went to offset our costs for paratransit and ride choice. So we had um, we used that money went well. We used our we had a combination of Prop 400 money and the COVID money to offset the city's contribution. So it, it's offset the city's contribution to be zero. Um, for the remaining of the fiscal years because we now have enough. Oh, this is funding. This is funding. Oh, okay. Right. I was wondering. Okay. Right. So, but if that you look sense. across at accessible transit, we have um, enough PTF through the course of Prop 400 to fund both paratransit and ride choice without having to have to ask for any general fund money, which we have had to do in the past. <coughs> Um, I always like to, even though these aren't funded by the general fund, I just want to point out um, in July, <coughs> Broadway Road will transition from being funded from the city's general fund to being funded by Prop 400. Um, and in October, we will extend Route 48 in, in Tempe that right now currently ends at Tempe Marketplace. That will be extended into Riverview and that's to um, grow right transit ridership in that corridor to support the streetcar project. This is um, just a summary of how much, so you can see what, what we pay in total for our contracted services. These are net costs. So the light rail um, has the expected revenues taken out of it. So Prop 400 is very important to the city of Mason, how we fund our transit transit service with almost $30 million. Jody, this, this does highlight again the fact that um, light rail is 100% pretty much locally funded. Yes, light supported, rail. Op supported, maybe. Yeah, light rail saying. operations and maintenance um, is, the rail cities are responsible for, for funding that. There is no regional funds to offset those costs. But when we talk about bus, which includes the tra paratransit and the ride choice, that's really shifted to now most of that, not all of it, but most of that is now being funded, funded by, PTO, by the region, by the, by the Prop 400 sales tax. Yes. Mr. Summers. So that begs the question, <clears throat> where are we in discussions with the state legislature on a Prop 400 and Initiative. Yeah, I don't know that's a Jody question to answer right now. We could we could certainly get a briefing from our intergovs because I know that's a ongoing conversation and dialogue that we probably should have at some point, Mayor. Yeah, I think uh, Ms. DeWitt and Mr. Butler and Mr. And Mr. Nissen could give us a, and it would change would every day probably because there's a moving target. So given that we uh, have to do with the e-session, let's, let's do... Uh, that's, that's the question of the of the year. So that's 
we do need to, to have an update for your council on that, but let's schedule that for yeah. another week. Yeah. I think she has one more slide. One more slide. And then we could break, Mary. Okay. okay. Um, and this is just a quick update on the shade program that we've been doing um, over the last couple of years. We've gotten money for to add shelters. We've had um, two years ago, we got some budget money to design the micro shelters. This is a drawing of what that micro shelter looks like and how it can be modular to expand. So as we as the bus ridership grows, we don't have to go put in a new shelter. We can just expand with what we have and um, use our resources as efficiently as possible. And that's it. Part two to be continued. All right. Thank you, Mr. Summers. I'll just because we're out of time here, I'm just going to say that the thing that alarms me from a fiscal perspective is paratransit and ride choice. We don't locally fund that. That's all Prop 400 money. The implication here is we isolate people who rely on the service both for getting to food but also to their health care. And that if we don't fund this in some measure, either locally or through Prop 400, that's going to shift to 911. So it's just going to be ambulance transports, and that's not that's not efficient. It doesn't help these folks. So that's something from a budget perspective we're going to have to look at. Thank you. Amen. All right. Um, moving forward, item 3A is to acknowledge receipt of minutes uh, of the committee, the Transportation and Sustainability Committee. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Ms. Billsbury. Thank you, Mr. Summers. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanim unanimously. Next is the current events and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? Ms. Spilsbury? Get through these quick. Um, on Thursday, I attended the um, Mesa Hispanic Network Lunch and Learn with Frankie and Carmen Heredia honoring Cesar Chavez. And I just was so impressed. And I think we're so lucky to have you guys. And I just wanted to say that, Frankie. It was really, really good. So um, I really enjoyed that Thursday evening. Um, Councilmember Duff and the mayor and I were able to attend our investitures, is that how you say it, for the new judges, mm -hmm. for our new judges, which was really um, awesome to finally get them all officially and formally um, put into our court system. And then Friday night was um, the Jefferson Rec Center Spring Carnival. We had a Tomorrow Mesa booth. Um, that, and there was like, the whole time we were there, there was people coming up and actually answering the questions about the survey, which I was shocked because I don't think I would do that if I was at a carnival. So I thought that was impressive. They did a good job. And then on Saturday night, um, the mayor and I were at, um, and other people from our city that went to support a new leaf, their camaraderie gala. That was fun. Um, and then just one more shout out. This Saturday is my Easter breakfast in my district. So bring your kids and grandkids. It's from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. at Greenfield Park with pancakes and a, all, of, all the things and an Easter egg hunt at 9 a.m. Thank you. That'll be fun. Who would like to go next? Ms. Go Duff? ahead and go. I'll try to be quick. Um, and I attended the investiture, as you mentioned. Also, um, that, was it that night? Yes. I attended a local first dining for dreams at the El Rancho. They have a commercial kitchen and they run that program teaching people how to be restaurateurs. And this is a dinner that they prepare the restaurateurs, um, aspiring restaurateurs prepare in order as a fundraiser for them. And soon we'll, in the next year or two, we'll have a uh, incubator in downtown and we hope to have those graduates opening their little mini restaurants here. Um, and Friday morning, I attended the Mason Urban Garden Day of Service for Cesar Chavez Day of Service to clean up the garden a little bit. It, thank you to all the volunteers um, that showed up and everybody. It was a great event. Afterwards, I attended the Arizona Bicycling Summit, learning more about how we can improve our bicycling infrastructure. Um, on Saturday, I attended uh, tomorrow's Mesa community event in Washington Escobedo neighborhood. Thank you to Jeffrey Robbins and Angelica Guerra, Guevara. I always mess up her last name. I apologize. And um, last night, uh, several of us were at Coopstock, was, which is a fundraiser for the Alice Cooper Solid Rock Teen Centers, and it was held at Las Sendas. Um, a, a golf course is beautiful and very successful. It, a lot of fundraising done there. So, and Saturday is the Reed Park uh, annual Easter egg event um, with Mesa PD with um, the Fiesta PD. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Uh, I'll just, uh, I appreciated being at some of those events as well. Saturday morning, I was invited by the contractor who's doing the uh, removing of the asphalt from the US 60 and diamond grinding the concrete um, to go out and kind of get up and close, cl up close and personal and s learn more about that. So I'd be happy to share that experience with anyone who's curious, but that's uh, uh, an interesting issue that uh, we deal with at MAG and, and uh, and other places, so I appreciated the opportunity to become more informed on that. Uh, if there's nothing else, Mr. Brady, what does our schedule of future we'll meetings look see like? see you on Thursday morning at 7.30. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Item six is to convene an executive session regarding uh, the De Silva litigation. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Thank you, Mr. Freeman and Ms. Uh, Spilsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We will now go into executive session.